The NFL draft has happened, and we are excited because we have former scout and NFL executive Russ Landy with us for the entire hour today to break it down just for you. That and more coming up on Sports Talk with Dad right now. Welcome back to another amazing episode of Sports Talk with Dad. As always, my name is Kyle, and I cannot call this Sports Talk with Dad without the man sitting next to me, a man who was alive before the sun ever was in the sky. <laughs> my dad, Jeff. If I'm that old, what's that make you? <laughs> a young, a young, yeah. handsome, pushing well 40. in shape, man. I'm not pushing 40, okay? <laughs> I'm not even 35 yet. Don't you start with me <laughs> on that bullshit. I don't want to hear your nonsense, Mr. I'm older than the sun itself. Everybody on NGBN TV thought you were in your 40s. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That was a great draft. It was a great draft. It was Thank fun. you for the NGBN team for having us on the live draft. It was a really good time. And coming up very, very shortly, we do have a man that was with us on that draft show, former NFL executive Russ Landy, that's going to answer some questions. Before we get into any of that, though, we do have to remind you that Sports Talk with Dad is brought to you by Family Farms. Welcome to Family Farms, where our culinary journey is woven with passion, dedication, and a commitment to crafting the finest bacon-wrapped chicken, a timeless delicacy that has tantalized the taste buds since 1974. At Family Farms, we're more than just a traditional name. We've evolved into purveyors of gourmet delights. Join us on this flavorful adventure where every bite tells a story of tradition, quality, and the enduring spirit of Family Farms. Now, we're waiting for us to come on here, but you and I have been arguing about one thing this entire weekend, which is the Michael Penix Jr. pick. If you're going to bring in a quarterback, why did you sign Kirk Cousins for $100 million? Because you need to have him sit for a little bit. They're doing this smart. Not if you're trying to be in win-now mode, which their owner is 104 years old. <laughs> he wants to try to get to a Super Bowl. You don't draft a quarterback when you have needs on the defense and you've got the eighth pick overall. But here's the issue, though. You're not going to be picking this high again, and you're not going to trade all of your future first-round picks, which you've seen time and time again, and it never works out for a quarterback when you can get your quarterback now. He can sit a couple years behind a guy who should have been the MVP last year if he didn't get hurt. Whether well, coulda, shoulda, if the dog eats They're going to win 10, 11 games the next few years, if not go on to be a Super Bowl champion. I know one thing for sure. Kirk Cousin got a message from Aaron Rodgers that night yeah. saying, hey, I know how you feel. Well, listen, you and I have argued about this enough, but people want to hear from an actual NFL executive. So we are bringing on right now former NFL scout and NFL executive Russ Landy. Russ, thanks for joining us again. No, it's my pleasure, guys. I love talking ball, and it was fun when I came on last time. All right, so we have been having an argument here, and I really need you to settle this once and for all. I am of the opinion that the Michael Penix Jr. pick by Atlanta is one of the best picks in the draft. Now, my dad over here is disagreeing with me. What do you think? I love the pick. Um, it really comes down to, I just look at three franchises over the last 10 or 12 years, the Bears, the Jaguars, and the Browns. And how many times did they chase the quarterback? The Bears with Trubisky, then Fields, then Williams. The Browns with Manziel and Whedon. I mean, it was on and on. And the Jaguars with Bortles. And it just goes on and on. When you don't have a quarterback, you're in a constant chase mode. Right. Now, is Kirk Cousins an elite, rare, top five guy? No. But is he a good, solid, workmanlike quarterback? Yes. And they're going to at least be solid with him. They have some weapons. They have a good offensive line. They're going to win nine, ten games the next two or three years. Right. They're not going to be in a position in the top five or seven to get this type of quarterback easily. That so is what I have been saying. But here's my yep. question. Yep. So you're right about that. They signed him to a $100 million contract, and I grant you it's front-loaded, so we're talking about a two-year contract. Wasn't the pressure going to be to get Penix in there? And is there something going on with Cousins Achilles that nobody's telling us yet? Well, the Achilles, I don't know. I'd be surprised if there was because I'm sure. I mean, there's a f two or three really good insiders, the Jay Glazers, the Adam Claytons, or Kaplans, excuse me, um, that get all the info. If there was something with Cousins, Achilles, 
within 24 hours of that pick, we would have found out about it because Kaplan and Glazer, they get everything. So that, that I, I doubt there's anything to that. Um, hey, the reality is we don't know how long he's going to play. He could play six years and, and Penix may end up going somewhere else. But if that's the case, then they're winning games and they're putting up big numbers on offense. And you know what? Then you trade Penix away for maybe a second or a third. Um, if you're winning, it's not a big deal. And if Cousins gets hurt or doesn't play as well as you hope, you've got a guy that at least your organization felt was worthy of being a top 10 pick that you got in the one year you had that high a pick. So it's not ideal. I get it. Everybody argues they didn't get better as a team, but this is not an awful team. Let's remember, you have some weapons on offense, a good offensive line, so they should be able to score regardless of adding many players on offense. So I think they have a chance to really help themselves short-term with Cousins and long-term with Penix. Well, that's what I've been saying. They built this right. Like, they have all their weapons ready to rock and roll here. They were just a quarterback away, and you have to draft him early. My only concern is, and this is one thing we talked about a little bit earlier, is this isn't a Rodgers to love or a Rodgers from Favre situation because the one thing Cousins doesn't have, he doesn't have that fan base, right? Favre and Rodgers both won a ring with Green Bay, and then they passed it off. Same with Montana to Young. And so fans were okay waiting with the quarterback they had fallen in love with. Cousins doesn't have that goodwill with the fans. As, as, a, as a former scout and ex executive, for somebody who sees the inside of this, if Cousins doesn't start playing well out the gates, the fans are going to start crying for Pennings to come in that, that quarterback situation. Is that a problem from inside the room, or is this just a fan thing that people have to deal with? I think it's more a fan thing. I mean, obviously, we don't know the, the personalities of Raheem Morris, their head coach, and, and Terry Fontenot, their GM. But one of the things I've been told over and over since I first got in the league is, if you are hearing or listening to the fans outside, then that means you, you'll you soon be outside with them because That's you can't worry point. about the fans. you got to do your job. Um, the reality is Cousins not having a history there is almost good. Really? Because, yeah, because – it really puts the onus on the head coach and the GM. They made the decision to go get Cousins. If it doesn't work and it's going badly, the owner is not going to say, oh, go ahead, blow him out, bring in Penix. He's going to say, wait a second, how much did we pay? Okay, if Penix is the guy, then maybe I got to remove you two and bring in a new head coach and GM. So I don't think they're going to immediately have a lot of pressure on Cousins. He, he's going to put that on himself. They're paying him a lot of money. And no rookie is generally good playing quarterback. Most rookies right. need a season or two to develop to even be average. So this is a good situation. Um, I think the hard part is, is some quarterbacks are great at being the mentor. Many, and I would say the majority, are not great at being the mentor. Right. Let's see how Cousins does being that mentor. Is he going to be that guy who takes him under his wing and says, hey, let me do everything I can like Kurt Warner did? Or is he even be a guy that maybe is a little more bristly and doesn't really go with that extra, put out that extra effort? And if he doesn't, then it's going to be up to Penix and the coaching staff to really make sure that happens, that they work together, even if Cousins isn't doing it. And I don't know if Cousins will or not. I'm not trying to throw him under the bus. I'm saying no. I don't know. We He's ready to start, but that's something I hadn't thought of before. That's brilliant. You know, when you to look at Favre to Rogers and Rogers to Love, just from the Packer background. Both times, that was a new GM. Ted Thompson came in. He didn't bring in Favre. You have uh, Gutekunst, who didn't bring in Rodgers. They both brought in their own guys. They both, the, the GM brought both these guys in. So this is, yeah. this is both their guys. So I never thought about it from that perspective before. This is definitely a completely different ballgame. Yeah, it is. And, and I look at it at, at, from the other perspective of a lot of people have sort of killed the Falcons saying, well, they didn't get better for this year. Well, let's also look at it from Terry Fontenot's point of view, which is maybe we didn't get better to where we're going to win a Super Bowl this year, but we got better adding Cousins. 100%. So they're probably going to be eight, nine, ten wins, keep their jobs, and then when Cousins' career is towards the end, they've already got the replacement. So this could guarantee them, as a GM and head coach, another six or seven years as the GM. Yeah, And I if think, you do that, that's pretty awesome. I think they're going to win the division. The one argument I've heard that I completely disagree with is everybody's talking about Penix being older. Well, if he sits two years and comes in when he's 26 and plays 10 years, he's 36. So what? 
Hey, even if he sits four years, right? Right. Look at all the quarterbacks playing until they're 37, 38. Hey, if you get eight good years out of a starting quarterback, you're thrilled because 50 only 55% of quarterbacks that go in the first round end up starting 40 games, at least over the last like 15 years. So if he comes in and starts eight years, that's freaking great. Well, that forget about me- how four or five years. If he gets eight years, you're thrilled beyond belief. 100%. Well, and that's that's one thing I've been hearing that's honestly been annoying me beyond belief. People are obsessed with this. Oh, they're wasting his rookie contract. The only way you win a Super Bowl is a, with a quarterback on a rookie contract. I think that is garbage. From you, what's your perspective on this? I mean, hey, is it easier if you get lucky and your quarterback by his so- second year in the league is killing it? Yeah, of course it's easier because he costs seven, eight million a year. Right. And you have you have over 200 million to spend on the rest of your roster. But at the same time, you aren't going to win with a good without a good quarterback. Yeah. So if all of a sudden he doesn't become good till this fourth, fifth, sixth year, you know what? You learn to work around it. The smart teams constantly are able to manipulate contracts and work around it. It doesn't look like the Chiefs have been destroyed the last five years <laughs> because they've been paying Mahomes a ton of money. Right. I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. You do have to let good players go, and sometimes you're yeah. playing with lesser players at other positions because you're paying a guy $50, $60 million. But let's also remember, three, four years from now, there are rumors that right now I think the cap is, what, 255 Something There like are that. rumors that because of gambling, the cap in four years could be 355 or 360 Wow. I if can that's believe that's true, now I don't know if it's true. That's just the rumor I've heard from some people. Even if it's 320 if Penix has played one year, you're not going to pay him sixty million a year. You right. might pay him thirty-five or forty. So right. say you pay him forty, he starts his fourth year. You take the fifth-year option. You pay him forty in his sixth season, six years from now, and that cap is three thirty. Do you care that you're spending no. even forty or fifty on him? No, it doesn't bother you. So I, I yes, of course you want to use the rookie contract, but. If you have a good quarterback, you worry about all that other stuff after. It's better to have the good quarterback and have to manage money than not have a good quarterback. Well, I'd much rather have Patrick Mahomes at $50 million a year and then have rookie wide receivers I now have to get to work with them than have top-tier wide receivers and a quarterback on a rookie contract that doesn't know how to play football. Well, and, and remember, like I said, very few rookies are very good. Usually right. it's that third season when they start to really blossom. And I get it. Everybody looks at the Wentz the golf going, going deep when they first got it. But there's a lot of factors that go into it. And the reality is a good quarterback makes everybody better. Good receivers can improve certain things, but they're not going to improve it as much as a good quarterback. So you worry about it. every team wants a good quarterback. No team gets rid of a good quarterback. They get rid of an average one, like yeah. an Andy Dalton. Nobody gets rid of the Justin Herberts, the Jalen Hurts. You keep playing with those guys. So... Let's go to my favorite team, or my, the one that intrigued me the most in this trap, and that was Denver, sitting at number 12, <laughs> trying to fool everybody that they weren't going to take Bo Nix, which it made sense looking at the draft. They had to get somebody. How do you think they did? Do you think Nix is the next coming of Drew Bledsoe? Or you know, do you- I don't know if I'd say he's the next coming of Drew Bledsoe, but there are a few things I like about Nix. Firstly, this is a guy who, six years in college, Started at Auburn. So that's big boy football. So he was legitimately a very talented kid, had his ups and downs, was not an elite guy at Auburn in terms of he would have good games, he would have awful games. But then he transferred to Oregon, which is also big boy football. And you saw him mature. He made better decisions. He was a better player. And he played at an extremely high level this final year at Oregon. So is he the complete package? And I'm not sure about that because there are some people who question, does he have much upside in terms of physical tools? But I think when you watch him, there isn't much he can't do physically. He's got a good arm. He's an underrated athlete. He has a lot of big-time experience in big-time games against high-end opponents. He's a good kid, mature beyond many rookies that are coming in the league. So there's a lot of things to like about this kid. So considering Peyton's system in terms of Sean Peyton, their head coach, his confidence in this kid, this kid's being so experienced, I see a lot of positives to it. Now, is that going to be enough for them to jump over the Chiefs and jump over potentially the Chargers? Maybe not. The Denver could be looking at two more awful years, regardless of how good Knicks plays. 
That's fair. I thought I, I, I Nix was one of my top rated quarterbacks. I think it's a great pick, but I do think starting him right away with that team is a mistake. What do you, I mean, I think starting any rookie quarterback right away personally is a mistake. What do you think on that one? Well, I, I think, and generally, yes, quarterbacks benefit from sitting, but I will say it is impossible to know, yeah. no matter how much homework you do, until they're in your building. Um, there are numerous times where I've spoken to teams that have interviewed quarterbacks and they, they've been very confident about the kid coming in and playing early. They get him for that rookie minicamp right after the draft, and these are first-round picks, and they say, yep, he's a year away. Fair. Or I've, heard, I've seen the other, where it's a smaller school kid, they draft him, and they feel, yep, this guy's going to be a project. After the rookie minicamp, they say, this guy's going to start as a rookie. So until they're in your building and you can see them actually take your playbook, get out on the field, show leadership, see if they can command the huddle, all of those things, you can't really make a determination of if he's ready or not. Obviously, you'd like him to sit, but certain guys also just have that something about them that they do better learning in games than they do taking a year on the bench to sort of absorb. Everybody's different. All right, the big question now, because there is rumor out there that the New England Patriots were offered by the Minnesota Vikings three first-round picks to jump up to the number three pick and decided to draft Drake May instead. Fools. I mean, if they didn't, if they were offered that and didn't take it, they were fools, as far as I'm concerned. But what do you think, Russ? Well, I think it's it's it, there's two things. Firstly, if they had Drake May the number one quarterback and felt he was so extraordinary that he was worth taking no matter what, I understand that. If they had monster grades and they're where they were saying this is a franchise quarterback, a once in a five or six year guy then I understand not taking that deal. But if they had him graded as, hey, he's the second or third best quarterback in this draft, we think he can be a good starter to turn down three ones where this is not – because Coach Belichick left, you now have a new GM and a new head coach. I honestly think if they went one and 16 this year, they're not going to fire those guys. Yeah. So do you trade down, you get two ones this year, and you have two ones next year. So next year you'll end up with – Four first-round picks by the time you play your second season as new head coach and GM, to me, that gives you a better opportunity of having a winning team. Now, does it assure you of getting a top quarterback? No. So that's where it comes down to how confident do you feel in Drake May? Do you feel he is so good that you wouldn't be able to get another one next year? And additionally, if you are not in love with Drake May, you think he's got a chance to be good, how good do you think Minnesota is going to be with him his first year? If you think they're going to be up and down, you might have another top 10 pick next year because they don't play well in his rookie year. And then you'll have a top 10 pick and another first round pick. So you could be in a great spot to get a quarterback then. Not that next year is a proven to be a good year at this point at quarterback, but you never know. So I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. I do think the fact that next year's quarterback class is rumored to not be particularly good could have played a role in them saying we don't feel comfortable trading out because next year there may not be anybody for us to take. That's fair. So let's take a look at the draft overall. Who do you think were the big winners? Who were the losers? Keep the Packers um, out of it because we're going to ask about them separately. I think the Bears did a great job. Um, I know there's some people, there's a big, there's going to be debate about Caleb Williams, but I think when you put all the quarterbacks on a chart, it's hard to not see his physical talent as a guy that's worth the roll of the dice at the top of the draft. I like the receiver they got. So I think with those first two picks, they did a great job. Um, I'm probably biased, but I think the Chargers came out of this really good because they got yeah. a great offensive tackle. Agreed. And then they got a really good returner in McConkey. So though, to me, those are two teams I look at and say, okay, I feel good that they came out of this in a great spot, that they're going to, in my opinion, improve this year now does it mean they're going to be without question come out of this as sort of in a great spot i don't know but i think they're going to come into this year everything looking like it's going to go well the big losers to me i look at the giants um because at least based on what i see it looks like the giants are basically saying hey we are going with daniel jones right yeah and although they drafted a receiver who looks like he is a legitimate guy that quarterback has to play better. And I don't know if Jones has shown enough to me to where I feel confident that this is a guy who can be a legitimate 
starting quarterback. And if he's not a legitimate guy, then they passed on the opportunity to go get one. Um, that one is the one that of all the teams makes me wonder what were they thinking? Like, is this the way to go? Um, it's a little bit of an odd thing. I will say the Raiders, I don't, I can't call them a losing team, but a little bit like the Giants, like what are they going to do? Where are they going to feel comfortable? Because now they have two very good tight ends. Yeah. I'm not sure what they're going to do, throwing the ball, running the ball. All of those things make me wonder. They have a lot of talent that they acquired. I just don't know if they've got the talent to be a winning team this year. What about Dallas? Everybody's destroying them and they're crap. You know, I mean, sort of when you look at the Cowboys, they're one of those teams that it's always hard to sort of get a feel for what they do because they're a unique team in that the owner is running the show, but they have some really good people under them. Um, I know a lot of people kill them on Guyton. Guyton is not a bad football player. He's a big kid. Um, I think he's athletic enough to play either side. I think it's going to take him a little bit of time. I like some of the guys they got afterwards. The kid BB that they got in the third round out of Kansas State. The kid Flournoy, the receiver out of SEMO, Southwest Missouri State, or Southeast Missouri State, is a kid that I like. I think this kid's got a chance to be sort of that sleeper guy that comes out of nowhere. And the kid they got late, Justin Rogers out of Auburn, this is a true nose tackle. He's going to be a guy that he's probably not going to help them this year much. He's going to rotate. But I could see him being a guy a year or two down the road that really turns into a, a value pick that they got that contributes. So I, I don't kill them for their draft. I know a lot of people pick on that first-round pick in terms of Guyton, but I think they're killing the poor, the wrong guy. This is, this is not a bad football player. I think he's going to help their offense line, especially with Smith gone. They need to bring in some young guys on this line, so I have no problem with it. I was impressed with what the Eagles did, getting Quinion Mitchell and then turning right around and getting uh, Cooper Dijon, Dijon, however they want to pronounce it this week. Yeah, I mean, it, clearly they wanted length and they needed corners. And I do believe that they, they try to draft the best player, so I don't know if those were um, guys that they reached for. I think they got two long, linear, athletic guys. Um, the Hunt kid that they got out of Houston Baptist is a very interesting kid as a linebacker. I think yeah. he's way better than the, I know, the hometown pick of Jeremiah Trotter that they picked up. And I got to say, I love the pick of Trevor Keegan, the offensive lineman from Michigan that they got late. Not a real special athlete, but this is a kid who knows what he's doing, technically sound. And you're talking fifth round. These are the types of guys that, are, guys that often make it strong, physical technicians late in the draft. They end up coming in. And with their coaching there, they they have either the best or second best offensive line coach in the NFL. I wouldn't be surprised if a year or two down the road, this guy's a starting interior line for the lineman for them, even though he'll never be regarded as a top athlete. All right. I need you to answer this question for me. Why does my team, the Packers, keep drafting kids that are hurt in college? Why does this keep happening? We have an offensive lineman, which I know you like. You guys try to talk me off the ledge with the draft coverage here. Jordan Morgan, right? The guys yep, got Morgan. a torn ACL two years ago. I mean, is this kid, he looks good. I like his size. I like what he does. But, man, he, it's another player that's hurt. Well, firstly, he's not currently hurt. So. He's not. It was two years ago. Yeah, You're yes. right. He played and all last And let's remember year. that many guys – have been injured and missed time in college in yeah. terms of with an ACL or an Achilles. So what you're looking at is were they healthy their final year? Yeah. And what do your medical people say at the combine? Yeah. So the fact that he went in the first round, clearly they didn't fail the kid on his physical. No. Um, and and he, I like the kids that I like offensive linemen from the Pac-12 or whatever you want to call it yeah. now because yeah. only two teams left because they throw the ball more than anybody else. They do. And this kid has a lot of pass blocking experience. I think he's a good fit for what they're looking for. Yeah. Everybody talks about him being a big kid, but he's not big like sloppy thick. He's no. big in terms of he looks taller than he is. He's got the long arms. I think this kid's going to play football and be a good player in the NFL. Whether it's at tackle or guard, I got no worries about this kid. I like him. I, I've started to change my tune. When I started seeing – because you mentioned the the pass blocking. He's solid at pass blocking, but what really impressed me, this kid in his entire college career didn't miss a run block. No blown blocks that led to tackles. That is impressive. Well, it also points to effort. Yeah, and that's it what really you does. Want because 
on run blocking, a lot of it is you get your your feet get tangled, you're out of position, and a lot of guys just, all right, I'm gonna fall. Yeah. But it's a matter of do you keep pushing, do you grab the guy, whatever it takes to keep him out of the play. So it tells you it matters to this kid. Yeah. And that alone can often be the difference between a guy failing and a guy making it. Because this is like I joked before, this is big boy football when you get to the NFL. It is. And guys that don't have passion and heart and desire to succeed, they fall off. They don't survive long. So this kid's got that. So that's why, there. yes, I know the ACL two years ago may concern you, but I'm really not that concerned. I think this is a kid that could be a long-term starter on the line. And when you yep. look at what they've done recently, they've done a good job of getting linemen that maybe weren't looked at as studs when they were coming out yep. to become solid players. Well, and going on with the Packers draft, they got Edron Cooper in the second round and then the running back, out of uh, Marshawn, and I'm going to say Marshawn Lentz, and that's wrong, but the running back out of USC, which I thought both of those picks were steals. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Lloyd kid out of USC, he's an interesting kid because he, he he's short. He's 5'9", yeah. but he thickly built. He's got a little twitch to him. He's got a little wiggle. Um, I like the kid. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he does. I think he's a perfect guy for what they're – going to ask him to do because I don't think they're going to force him to be the guy right away. Right. So they're going to get time to work with him and he's played in a pro style offense. So it's going to be a little bit of an ease of a transition. Yeah. He's a good football player. I think he will uh, be a guy that's able to contribute. I'm not saying he's going to be a guy that's going to be a playmaker right away, right. but I also got to say two of the guys I really like that they got late, late round, the Glover kid from Georgia state this mm-hmm. is a big old offensive lineman, good athlete. Um, Needs work playing at Georgia State, but there's something to like there. And the Kalen King kid, you talk about a kid that a year ago people were very excited about. He needs a little bit of work on his technique. But this isn't a tiny little corner. This is a kid that's between 5'10", 5'11". He's a good athlete. There's something there that's worth taking a roll of the dice with late. There's something about this kid I like. What did you think of Cooper in the second round? You know, I think he's a good player. I'm The only concern I have when I watch that kid play is just – where, where am I going in terms of, is this kid going to be big enough? He's athletic. He can run. Um, I just, he's not huge. I just wonder if he's going to get beat up a little bit, but I mean, this kid is twitchy. He can run when he's off the ball. He can get sideline the sideline. He can cover. So there's a lot to like about this kid. My only concern is just durability because he's a little, he, and when I say little, he's about six to an half, about 225, 230. So he's not tiny, but just when you see him, he doesn't look, Big. Well, I tell you what, I wish I was that little. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd take the couple extra inches. Man, I'd hate to see what you think of me at six foot. <laughs> yeah, it just he, he doesn't even look six three. He doesn't. He really yeah, doesn't. And that, that's what it really guy. is. He looks like a like a six one, two oh nine, two two fifteen guy because he's just explosive and he can run. Yeah. But my only question is just the durability. I like him as a player. I think the guy makes plays. He has really good range to make plays all over the field. So there's a lot of things to like about him. Everything I've heard about the Packers draft, it was workmanlike. It was very Packer esque. You know, there was yep. Nothing they're that they're not a out. team that reaches. They generally stick with. They got to be good on film. They generally have to at least test decently. They got to interview well. They don't roll the dice on guys that are maybe poor testers but good football players, or elite testers but really awful or unproductive football players. They try, and it's sort of like what the Ravens do. You have to be good on film. You yeah. got to at least test above average, and then we'll figure out the rest and figure out where you fit on our board. Now, why is that a strategy for some teams but not others? Because I would think that's what you want to see. You want to see that they're good on film in games. But people seem to fall in love with kids in the combine all the time. So why why do people go away from looking good on film and go for something else? Well, there there well first there's a million different philosophies. Sure. Um, Part of it is like for, especially when you look at pass rushers and you look at corners, yeah. um, it's so hard to find special guys. Yeah. You, we can find the try hard effort pass rushers or the, or, or the adequate corners who are there to make the tackle, but don't make plays. But the pass rushers that are special, whether they're defensive ends or tackles or corners that are special, they're elite athletes. There are very few who aren't elite athletes. So what happens is, when you start looking at your board and start saying, geez, these defensive linemen, they're, they're good. They're solid guys. Do we want to take the guy who's solid, who's going to try hard and all that? Or here's the special guy. And if we take his best plays, 
he shows the ability to be special. And let's remember, if we if we take it to the core of core, what is a coach? A coach is a teacher. Yeah. And if you go problem. to any teacher at any school in America, they all think they can make their students better. Well, that's what coaches believe. There are a lot of coaches who believe if you show it to me once, I can make them do it all the time. So, and and every team wants a guy like, I mean, I'm Miles Garrett or, or, or Nick Rashawn Gary. Rashawn Gary was a guy who really didn't yeah. look good on film in exactly. Michigan at all. Exactly. Yep. And that's why they rolled the dice on him. He's yeah. a special athlete. And Jadavon Clowney may be the ultimate example. True. He may be the best athlete to play the position in 20 years. And he's never been a consistently dominant player in the NFL. But Houston took him first because they're just there's only so many humans on the planet yeah. that can do what he does. So you roll the dice because you can find the try-hard, average athlete, competitive guys who can get you six sacks and be solid. You can't find special athletes. And they're only – my old boss used to say there are only so many humans on the planet who can change games in the NFL. There are a lot of guys who can be solid and do a good job. But changing games, game-changing players, that's how you win championships if you don't have a great quarterback. Well, let's go back to a previous draft, because I've heard this a lot. Devontae Wyatt came out of Georgia to Green Bay, hasn't looked special so far. But now they're changing the offense for him to be more defense. similar to what they – or defense, thank you mm-hmm. – to what they were playing in Georgia. Do you, is that going to make a huge difference for some of these athletes that are on the line or linebackers? Well, 100%, it, one of the things you want to do and you, you try to do it is when you have a kid, whether he's already been there or he just got there, you want to, unless they're obviously, I mean, late round guys that you don't think a lot of, but guys that you think have talent, you say, okay, what do I have to tweak and adjust to make it fit for them? Because if you're going to draft a kid and slam that square peg into, into a round hole, the odds are it's going to fail. When you draft a kid who's good at and I'll give you, uh, say we talk about like um, the corner that the Eagles took, the, the kid in the first round, the Mitchell right. kid. Mitchell. Um, if you take him and you say, okay, here's your strength. You're an athlete, you're long, but we're going to play you off the ball and play in zone all the time. It would be like, well, the, his strength is getting up and being a great athlete man to man. It would sort of be dumb. Why are you asking him to do that? Well, sometimes teams don't adjust their system to what they have. And yeah. sometimes you realize, you know what? Some of the guys we have aren't fitting in what we're doing. We're changing things up. So we're going to ask him to do what we think he's good at. And sometimes that's a learning process. You bring a kid in, you're not sure where he's going to fit. He has a year or two where he's bouncing around trying to find a home. And you finally say, ah, we think we figured it out. This is what he'll be good with. We're going to adjust it. So this is what he's asked to do. So it can definitely make a huge impact. You talking about putting a square peg in a round hole like that reminds me of what the Packers did with Jair Alexander the last couple of years. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, he's a guy that, I mean, there's a lot of talent there. I mean, yeah. there are a lot of people in the league who don't like little corners, but he's a good football player now. He's a very good football player, and I hope they use him better in this defense. I'm excited to see. I do have another question because you mentioned this, and I have been aching to ask you this question. I know you have too. You mentioned when we were doing the live draft coverage, you used to work for Dick Vermeil. This is very true. I was very fortunate. I only worked for him for a year and then unfortunately got fired for being a smart ass by the Charlie Army, our GM there. Uh, but yeah, it was an amazing experience. And to this day, I mean, Coach Vermeil is a big part of why I got my next job at the Cleveland Browns. Really? Um, yeah. It, when I uh, interviewed there and I got the job, um, someone that was there asked, when I, in my presence, he said, how, what was the sort of deciding factor to hire Russ over other people? And Dwight Clark, who has since passed away, who was the president at the time, said yeah. it really came down to that there were two people. There was me and another person. And he said, the reality is, and he said this in front of me, he was being yeah. very honest. He said, we really didn't have like a big difference between you two. He said, you both interviewed well. You both did a good job grading film for us in your interview. Um, and he said, but he goes, Coach Vermeil called every single day to tell us we should hire Russ. Wow. So he said, we figured if we hire Russ, Coach stops calling. And if we have to fire him, there's nothing Coach can do about calling anymore because Russ failed. Right. Whereas if we hire the other guy, Coach probably still keeps calling. Yeah. So he said, it's probably just to keep Coach from calling that we hired <laughs> Russ. <laughs> so what made Dick Vermeil so special? He had a unique ability to get everybody, no matter their background or anything, 
to buy into his plan. And, and just to give you an example, have, I, I mean, there's so many things I can point to, but I'll give you two stories. So um, my first year when I, when I was working for the team, uh, I was dating someone that was living in, back in Los Angeles. And we were in St. Louis and I'd been grinding for a coach. He had taken the job in January and this was now, I don't know, May, I think. And I had been nonstop, hadn't missed, like been worked every day. There hadn't been a day off. And um, I told him, hey, I'm booking a trip. I'm flying to L.A. for three days. So he said, that's great. He said, before you go to L.A. or before you leave for the day for your for the flight, come into my office. So I went into his office and he said, Ross, he said, you know, I'm an L.A. guy. I'm UCLA. He goes, this is the restaurant that I go to. He said, I already called. I made you a reservation. He said, just go there tomorrow night. It's all taken care of. Wow. So it, and it wasn't anything expensive. It wasn't like it was like $500. Right, sure, it was probably sure. $100 dinner. But it was the fact that he thought ahead and said, hey, this is my grunt. Like I was one of the gophers there. And then he thought enough to say, hey, this guy's been busting his ass for four months. He's going out to see the girl he's dating. Um, I'm going to make sure I take care of him. What so a leader. That's it, awesome. it was amazing. And then the other thing that really was amazing was – we were getting down in it, and you guys may or may not know, but in the NFL, like Thanksgiving and Christmas are work days. Like, right. You don't get those days off. Yep. So the four or five days prior to Thanksgiving, Coach had one of the secretaries walk around to every desk in the office, not just football ops, but marketing, sales, and everything, yeah. and find out who was single. And every single person was told, be at Coach's house for Thanksgiving. Wow. So Coach had – there weren't a ton of us, probably 20 of us. Yeah. But – we're there, and he and Carol, his wife, who's just the most amazing person, she cooked the meal. Like, it wasn't catered. Oh, she wow. cooked, and he used the smoker because um, he's a big smoker guy. Got it. And they served the meal, and he had the, the – and he and he's a big wine guy. And he's busting out $1,000 bottles of wine for us wow. single That's gophers awesome. and stuff. He's just one of those people that – he's amazing. He literally is the salt of the earth, the best person I've ever worked for. Guy that you would walk through fire for without asking a question. And that's what he that's what he gets you to do. I mean, his players believe him. And he, trust me, he'll even tell you, not every decision he makes is right. Not everything goes the way he wants it to go. And there's no guarantee we're going to win. But we're going to do this as a team. One of the things he did when he first got to the organization was he talked about, hey, every person in the building, when we lose a game, you should go to bed at night. And he, and he was talking in a, I don't remember who was there. It was a lot of people. It might've been the whole organization or might've been yeah. bits and pieces of it. But he said, Hey, whether it's Ken, the janitor or this person in this department or this person, he said, you need to go to sleep after we lose and think, how do I do my job better this week so yes. that the coaches have an easier time and the players have an easier time so that we can be better next week. He said, every person in this building affects our winning. And he said, nobody should be smiling if we don't win. That's the attitude. And, mm -hmm. and he changed the mentality of, there were a lot of people there when he got there that were just happy that St. Louis had a team yeah. and didn't really care about winning and losing. Sure. And he made it, hey, like there were times, and I had been there for three years, there were times we'd lost a game that first year and I'd walk down the hall and I'd say, coach, how are you? And he goes, we lost, things are bad. <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay. I like oh. it. Like it was an eye opener, but he didn't mean it to be a schmuck. He meant oh. it like, hey, Every game matters, and if you're not pr trying to win every game, you're not doing your job in this build in this building. You know, you've got guys like Vermeil, players coach, as they could say, but then you've got other guys, Buddy Ryan, Vince Lombardi, Belichick to a certain extent, that aren't like that. They're very hard driven. Belichick as well. I don't want to hear your anti Belichick know, but, nonsense. But Lombardi on the outside was a real hard ass and you know drove his players but all of the players would do anything for that guy and yeah. loved him it seems to be a common denominator between all great coaches whether it's bobby knight dick vermeil yep. leaders well men. i think i think what you find and this is something that uh our punter actually at the rams a guy named sean landetta who punted for like 600 years in the league <laughs> um and punters and kickers are bored during the day right yeah if they're in meetings for an hour and then they practice for like 30 minutes. So Sean used to come hang with me when I was doing my work and watching film. And one of the things he talked about with Parcells and he said, Vermeil rumor, I don't, I don't remember what year he was there. I, I don't think he was speaking to his playing under Vermeil, but just the um, sort of the, what people thought of Vermeil. Sure. Um, but he said Parcells ability 
to understand what made each person tick and how to motivate them was the difference. And he gave an yeah. example of, he said, there was a, they had played on a Sunday and he was in the treatment room Monday morning. And the next week they were playing on a Monday night. And he said, the door to the training room opened and Parcells literally said, Hey, Sean, I see you there. Get your treatment already working on your excuse when you screw up on Monday night football. <laughs> and he said, before he could react, the door was closed and Parcells was gone. And he said, it wasn't to be mean. He said, Bill just knew each person's mental makeup and yeah. how to motivate them. And I think that's what the great coaches do, whether they're screamers like Buddy Ryan or analytical guys like Coach Belichick or emotional and analytical guys like Coach Vermeil. Every single one of them figures out what makes their guys tick because if you can't motivate, you cannot win as a head coach. That's awesome. Now I have to ask because I'd be a bad co-host if I didn't ask this question. And you don't have to answer it, but what did you say that made you a smart ass that made you go to the Browns from the Rams? You know, I honestly, there's a, I, I've never really been told exactly what it was. I think part of it was my first boss with the Rams was an old guy who yeah. had been in the league for 40 years named Jack Faulkner. Um, and Jack was awesome, but he had no lack of confidence because he'd been around. I mean, he was the yeah. head coach and GM at 29 of the Denver Broncos. So he oh, didn't wow. work. So he always said, hey, whatever, if you got an idea, throw it out there. Yeah. So like my, I was I was working for a team a month and he had me preparing reports for the special teams coach. Nice. So there was no hesitation. When I moved with the team about six months after the team moved to St. Louis, I followed them at that point. Okay. And I went from working for Jack where I had basically just say whatever I want get to St. Louis, I do my job, and then all of a sudden they fire everybody, Charlie Army comes in, and Charlie Army was very, very sort of straight-laced. Mm -hmm. There was no sort of relaxing to him. But no one at that point, and it's not their fault, it's completely my fault, but I had never gotten the impression, hey, bite my tongue, don't speak ah. up. So I kept, like we were in meetings where the coaches, co everybody is there, and I would contradict what Charlie was saying. Mm -hmm. And with Jack there, it would have been fine. But Charlie, I could see when I would do it every once in a while, like he would turn red and get mad. And it didn't occur to me, hey, stop doing that. Because I was 26 or 27. Right. It didn't occur to me, I'm screwing my career up. I thought, well, he's mad, but I'm doing my job. Yep. So it was just me being really immature, not understanding that, hey, every person that you work for is going to have a different level of what they want you to do. That's fair. That's a good learning lesson, though. Oh, it was. I mean, hey. He and I, Charlie Army to this day, I mean, he's without question the guy I learned more from than anybody else in the NFL, even though he fired me. Yeah. And when the Browns called him for a reference, to this day, I was amazed because Dwight Clark told me that he said Russ was immature when he was here. But if you feel in your interviews that he has matured, he will be one of the five best scouts in the NFL. That's wow. awesome. So That's for him great. to say that tells crazy. you a lot about him as a person. Yeah. And it was very nice of him to say, obviously, that it helped me at least stay in the mix at that point for the job. Yeah, I would say, you know, I never uh, learned that lesson, you know, ever with, where I was a smart ass when I shouldn't have been. You know, never <laughs> in my 20s did I mouth off to people I shouldn't have. So, you know, I can't say I know how you feel. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough lesson to learn. I still have to bite it my is. tongue a lot. I was in minor league baseball, and I've told you the story, but yeah. worked for a guy there, and I was able to do things they hadn't done there before. We packed the stadium a few times because of promotions I ran after I was done playing. And he never said a word to me about it. You know, not good job, not anything. Well, I go to apply for a job later on in the CB, the old CBA as director of marketing and sales. The guy who was interviewing with me called me afterwards and said, I'm hiring you, but don't list that guy as a reference anymore. Because he went on about how terrible you were for 20 minutes. I hi I'm hiring you because anybody you could piss off that badly must mean you're awfully good. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, at least he had an open mind, right? Otherwise, he might have, uh, that guy could have torpedoed you. He tried. Tried. He tried yeah, to torpedo definitely me. definitely did. There's no doubt. And the guy I worked for was a hard ass of hard asses. But oh, wow. I, I learned a lot from him, respected him, and he had even though he would get frustrated with me because of my first time in the CBA running a basketball program. Um, he admired my work ethic and uh, had my back throughout. Now, Russ, one more question before we hop off, because I, sure. I, I do, if it's all right, I just want to ask you, you mentioned breaking down films for interviews as a scout. 
I'm just interested, like, what does that look like? What are, what are they asking you to do? How are they grading you on? Well, like when I went to the Browns that year, the, the draft had just happened. Um, Nate Clements, a cornerback out of Ohio State, had been a first-round pick of the Bills. Yeah. Um, and they said, here's three games, go grade Nate Clements. Hmm. Um, I honestly don't know if that's a great way to do it because, well, in my head, I know he's a first-round pick. Right. Um, and because I've been doing draft coverage, I'd already looked at him on TV film. I didn't have game film at the time. Um, but I went and graded him, and I actually wrote him up and didn't give him a great grade when I wrote really? him up to the team. I gave him, I said he was a, I think I gave him a second or third round grade saying, hey, this kid's got a chance, but he's got a lot of flaws. Um, every team does it differently. Some teams just want to see if you actually go and really grind and watch the film yeah. and take your time. Also, they give you a time limit because one of the things that you used to have to do, it's not the case anymore, when you were a college scout, you had to go to colleges and watch the film. Sure. So you had about four hours at a school to watch three offensive games and three defensive games before you had to go to practice, talk wow. to the trainer and all that. So you had to be able to watch film at a good pace and still get good notes. Not that that was your final report, but you had to at least be somewhat thorough. So I think they do that to say, okay, and it, they would give me, I think they gave me 40 minutes. And they said, here's three games on Clements. You have 40 minutes to grade them and to, to write something up. So that's what I did. Huh. So I think part of it is just to see, a, how can you watch film in terms of time? How do you express yourself? And I think also, I think they just want to see, are you really going to do it? There right. are some guys that will put on the film and it'll just run and they won't rewind and they'll just sort of let it run and they don't really get into the watching of the film. Got it. So it was a weird deal. I'd never done it before, but obviously I didn't screw it up too bad because they hired me. That's true. That's true. I was just curious because there's so much that goes into being a scout in any sport, but especially the NFL we don't see as fans. That's not something we're exposed to at all. And so having no. you here to talk about this, I'm, I'm learning so much what actually goes into the grind of every single day. Well, and speaking it, of that. It's a tough job. Yeah. Speaking of that, okay, we get through the draft. That's the big show for scouts and whatever. You make your picks. What happens in the war rooms and the team rooms right after the draft? And what are this, when does the scouting start for the next season? Um, well, right after the draft, it's the mad rush for the undrafted guys. Um, and that starts really day two of the draft. You're talking to your kids, selling them that you're going to be drafting them on day three. Yeah. Then on day three, you're lying to them and saying you're trying <laughs> to get them drafted, but you know you're not going to. Right. But you're, you're, you're selling them on that. So that first three hours, four hours after the draft, it's a mad rush. Contracts, signing, e-signing. Um, basically, the first week after the draft, you go home and most teams will fly their scouts back either the first weekend or the second weekend when they have rookie minicamp because they want you to get a look at the kids you just drafted, be there, get that experience. Most teams after that, you go home. And depending on the organization, some teams believe during the summer, we want you to grade. Not You don't have to write reports or some teams will have you, but most teams just watch three games on every major school, every Division One school in your area just so you're familiar with your guys when you go out in the fall. Other teams say, no, this is a hard job. You travel a lot. We don't want you doing anything until you come to training camp in July. You come to training camp for 10 days. You do that. You go home for three weeks, and then you hit the road. But some teams really want you to take that 10 weeks, 10, 12 weeks, and do nothing over the summer. They want you to recharge and forget about it. Yeah, I can see both ways uh, being good and wanting to recharge. You mentioned your area. So as a scout, do you guys have regions then that you guys cover? Yeah, you break, they break it down depending on the organization. Um, it's all by a estimated number of prospects. Um, okay. They try to keep it about equal. So if you're in the Southeast, you're basically going to have Florida, Georgia, and um, I don't even know what the next state. Alabama. Maybe, maybe Alabama. Whatever's next to Georgia. Right? Sure. So off the top of my head, I'm having trouble. South Carolina's there. Yeah, so that's probably – you get three states. If you're out west, you may get California, Oregon, Washington, okay. Utah, Colorado. Um, when I was in the Midwest, I had 11 states. Wow. Because there aren't wow. a lot of players. Like, I mean, I had, I'm going to try to recite this. It's always tough. Kansas, <laughs> Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wyoming, Montana. Jeez. A lot of, you can't get Wyoming has here. one school. Montana has yeah. two schools. That's true. Iowa really has two schools. They have some small schools, but really it's Iowa, right. Iowa State, Northern Iowa, but I mean, they have an A guy a year. So, it's really trying to make it so that each scout evaluates, well, not evaluates, writes reports on between 350 to 400 guys a year. Wow. Each many, person. And about 40 to 60 of them are draftable. How many scouts are, does each team hire? 
It varies. Um, for college scouting, you'll have anywhere from six to 10 college scouts covering areas. You'll have one or two guys above them, sort of what we call over the top, which is they'll cover half the country. And then you'll have a director on top of them. So like my buddy is the director of college scouting for the Chargers. Yeah. So he has two or three senior guys under him. And then he has seven or eight area guys under those guys. Now you said college scouting. What other scouting is there? There's something called pro scouting. And that's something that no one ever talks about or knows. Pro scouting is evaluating NFL players, CFL players, UFL players, wow. all the players in the German league. And in addition, anybody that comes through the NFL draft that doesn't get signed as an undrafted free agent, doesn't yeah. get drafted, they automatically get dumped in the pro pool. So they're evaluating wow. all those players, NFL practice squads. And during the season, you're bringing in players off the street for workouts because the pro department, aside from grading the other NFL players for free agency, your biggest thing is making sure the ready list is good. The teams that are successful and are healthy at the end of the year are the ones that have great ready lists. So when they lose yeah. a star player, the players they replace them with and move up the depth chart, they have good players. Teams that do a bad job of maintaining ready lists through film evaluation, bring guys into workout. As the year goes on, the injuries really cut them down because they haven't done a good job of preparing yeah. for those. So that pro department is so vital. They're yeah. also involved in advanced scouting because they're in the building. So they're scouting opponents and a lot of times giving reports to the players, not the coaches, as to, hey, you're going against this tackle. Here are some of his habits. Really? Here are things you can take advantage of. Yeah. That's crazy. I never would have thought of that. So you have guys that are just like scouting, which makes sense to my brain now that you've think said Rus it. But think Rasul Douglas. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like the Packers got Rasul du Douglas from the Cardinals practice squad. Now I had always yep. thought they just brought him in to see what the Cardinals defense looked like, but he ended up being a star. No, they probably had good grades on him. And at some point, depends on if they just brought him in to work him out or if they just brought him in and yeah. signed him. It, it, that you're a good pro department is enormously valuable because like I said, it helps form your ready list. It helps you find guys that other teams may overlook. Yeah. Um, and in addition, it really, every once in a while you'll hear about when a team finds a key mm -hmm. um, from watching film that a certain guy aligns a certain way and it gives away what the offense or defense is doing. Well, you notice that sometimes wow. when you're watching film and all of a sudden you're like, holy smokes, when he does this, we know they're running a slant from that side of the field. So it's like, oh man. Wow. So now that doesn't happen often because teams right. are so good at self-scouting. They usually right. catch it. But every once in a while, the old famous one was when Jerry Rice, I think it was when he lined up on the numbers, you knew what, what route he was running. And when he lined up <laughs> inside the numbers, he was running one of three routes or something. Something along those lines. I don't wow. remember exactly. But there are famous, famous stories of the scouting department picking up a key and it became nice. literally, you could tell, run or pass. Now, time out, because go back a little bit, because you said sometimes the scouts will pick this up, give it to the players. I thought that's what the coaching staff did. You're telling me that's a scouting department that does that? Well, the coaching staff, they're watching They're watching the bigger picture. Like, they're, they're here's the, the game plan. Yeah. Here's what we're going to implement. What I'm talking about is you may have an individual report, that, and not every team does this. Some do, some don't, where you're giving the report to the players, and the players will look through it. Because remember, the good players, they're watching a lot of film. 100%. And you, can, and you can give them film and say, hey, when you're going up against, say you're going against a Bacchiardi, yeah. and these guys don't get to watch film every of this guy for six, seven games. They, right. get, they get a quick, they're there for a day, basically, before they're knee-deep in game planning. Makes sense. So if they can get a one-paragraph summary of, hey, Bacchiardi's pl not playing as well this year, we're not sure what's wrong, but he's not really using his inside hand as violently as normal, or he's he's really upright this year. He's still favoring that knee. Um, little things that'll be in there that some players don't even read them. They just throw them in the trash. Other players really look at it and say, okay, and then they'll go watch film to sort of either back it up or to completely disregard it. But yeah, some teams are very diligent. That was one of my first jobs at the Rams was my boss would grade the starters of the opponents and I would grade the backups. So, so we would provide me, reports to the players. So you, you know the movie Replacements, right, with Keanu Reeves and Gene yep. Hackman? So you're telling me when the girlfriend's in the car giving him the scouting report on the guys, the, the one girl she knew's boyfriend, that actually happens in the NFL? A little bit more in depth, but yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> important to know. Like when you have a player come onto the field, you need to know, hey, this is his strength, this is his weakness, this is what he does. And it may be as simple as little tells. Yeah. Hey, He's going to line up and do this when he runs goes. Okay, good to know. Because if he's a backup, especially, you may not know that. 
So having somebody that's paid attention and watched all these details, you can find out little tricks or you find out like, hey, when this guard comes in, if anybody gets hurt and this guy comes in and plays next to this tackle, they're awful against stunts. But when he lines up on the other side, they do fine versus stunts. Are you giving the scouting report in game too? Like, is that something you can do? No, no. No. I mean, you can, but they don't really do that because the scouts are working on advancing the next team. Um, But yeah, you'll give little things and you'll tell the coaches. Like the coaches pick up on most of what you're doing, but they have so much stuff. They don't have time to put a report to get to give to the players. And usually that report will go to the players, but you'll also give it to the coaches. And sometimes you'll present to the coach and say, hey, here are three big keys we saw on film that you guys are going to probably want to do extra work and see if you see what we're seeing. I they struggle for the versus stunts release. and loops and stuff. It's There's a lot of work that goes into it that people have no That's idea about. Great. This is a grind, man, because, again, I'm, I'm a fan, right? I've never been in a scouting department or anything, so I see it, and I'm like, oh, you go watch players. There is so much more to this than I even realized. Well, I'll give you just a quick story. I, when I lived in Jersey, I played poker every week at my house. Hey, I'm with you. We got to play one day. I love poker. Okay. <laughs> one of the guys, huge football fan, loved it to death. Yeah. Thought, he was like, man, I'm so jealous. You have the greatest gig ever. Da, da, da. And he was a broker. So yeah. he had, he could adjust his schedule. Said, right. Hey, tell me today, come on over. I have film. We'll watch film. So he was like, what time? I was like, well, I'm going to start about eight. I said, Kim leaves to work. I drop Abby at daycare. I said, yeah. come on over. So he gets there like 8.15. We throw on the film. And I don't remember what player we're watching. Sure. We were only watching one. I wasn't going to try to watch five players with him at sure. once. His head would explode. <laughs> I think we made it for about an hour and a half. And he finally said, yeah, we can stop because this is boring as all get out. Yeah. He goes, because when you watch the same play nine or 10 times, he was like, yeah, what are we doing? It's like, well, look at his kick slide. Look at where is his foot placed on the right angle? What's he doing with his hand? And he was like, yeah, this ain't for me. He That's goes, crazy. I like football. He goes, I don't like watching the same play 20 times. <laughs> That's fair. But that is something you have to do. I mean, you have to know have to. every in and out of this player and how they play. That can make yep, the difference really between a, an all-star and a bust, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And that's crazy. why teams, certain teams are very good at finding guys late in the draft yeah. or undrafted guys because they have guys that grind on the really fringe players. So they find a few guys who really are great players. Yeah, They just may be a little small or they don't test very well, but they're great high-level players. And maybe you can slip in and get one of them as an undrafted guy. And all of a sudden, they're making your team and contribute. Yeah. I mean, look at Julian Edelman, right? The kid was a quarterback. And then all yep, of a sudden, we actually, signed. my service, we had a, we had a fifth round grade on him when Did he came really? out. Yep. Wow. One of my guys that worked for me really liked him and said, we need to look at him. We, yeah. we missed on some guys, but we had him. We had Richard Sermon, the number two corner in the draft. Yeah. I mean, we had some, we had some big hits and some big whiffs, but that's part of the business. <laughs> As, part of it. As you do, who is your biggest whiff ever? And, and if you're, if you don't want to ever, answer, it's, have no, to. it's fine. It's Ryan, uh, Ryan Nassib, a quarterback out of Syracuse. Yeah. Um, He's to this day the guy I've given the highest grade of any player to. Really? Yep. And? I thought he was going to be a slam dunk, elite quarterback, just a star. Yeah. And to this day, and I've gotten to know the GM of the Giants over the last 20 years, and I've asked him about Nassib, and he's honest. He said, A, we never saw that talent. And he said, We thought he was an interesting prospect with a chance. He goes, But I can't tell you why he didn't make it. And that's one of the things that drives me nuts. <laughs> and then the Because I don't know what I missed on. It's the mental game, though, right? We talked about that on the live draft side. That's a of huge things. part of it. I mean, it's the mental side, the, the years. commitment. Yeah, it's not easy. I Being a quarterback tell- is the hardest job in sports. Yeah, absolutely. Other than the catcher. But yeah, catcher today, stuff, too. I heard today that some people are saying Michael Pratt, the Packers get the quarterback from Tulane, could be a steal. He's a good football player. Traditional pocket passer type guy he can make the throws yeah i mean where they got him it's a good value yeah. um i like him there were there were a lot of guys late in the draft that i liked of quarterbacks that had a chance there was the the kid austin red out of western kentucky that kid a kid out of trinity university in texas but yeah i think pratt's got a chance um and he's been well coached because although uh coach fritz is gone he was there under fritz and fritz is one of the best college coaches i've ever been around really so for Pratt to have made it through Fritz, he, <laughs> he it's just like the old when Bill Snyder's at Kansas State. You don't get out of Coach Fritz or Kansas State or, or Alabama without being tough. That's you're just, you're not gonna you're not gonna survive and not and and get out if you're not mentally tough. So this kid's mentally tough. Nice. Whether he's good enough to play at the NFL level, we don't know. 
but mental toughness will not be the problem. Well, hopefully with Jordan Love being a Hall of Famer, we'll never Would have you... to find out in Green Bay. You never know. <laughs> hey, you never know. Another year before we put a gold jacket on. Gold jacket. Hey, Jordan it's amazing. Love. He's the Hall of Famer, and yet they never even wanted to keep Kurt Warner around the year he was there in training camp. So Yeah, would... well, we can have that conversation for another day. I have my own opinions <laughs> there. But either way, Russ, you are amazing as always. Thank you so much for joining us today course no this was a blast guys love talking ball and excited to be on your show and to do more stuff with the uh ngbn people so hey. it all looks awesome we're excited thanks russ, thanks, we'll talk russ. To you soon. have a good one guys thank you, you. i learned a lot today i did too a lot of- he was right about the pennix pick which i called in the beginning by the way which was a very good decision we'll see you. and we're also going to see if caleb williams is going to be a great pick or if he's going to be another Chicago Bear balloon bust. Bears will be the Bears. Just build your defense and build a running back. That's how you want a Super Bowl in the first place. Forget the quarterback. <laughs> you keep failing at the quarterback they had position. had Sid Luckman at one time. Leave him yeah. alone. Yeah. Well, that, that was before you were born. Yeah. Which tells you how long ago that was. But you and I have had a great show. But as always, the scariest part of my day, you cannot... Have a conversation with your dad without your father getting the last word. So it is all you. So we just finished up for many adult football fans a day, second only to Christmas Day, and that being the NFL draft weekend. It got me thinking, though, will the guys that were drafted over the weekend be the players that are going to change a franchise forever, or are they just going to be guys that will be there for a couple of years and will fade off into the sunset? Do the Chicago Bears or the Washington football team you're really praying that a Jaden Daniels or a Caleb Williams is going to end up on your Mount Rushmore of great players, which got me thinking, who would be on your individual team's Mount Rushmore if you're a Los Angeles Chargers fan or a Dallas Cowboy fan, or in my case, a Green Bay Packers fan, who would you put on the Mount Rushmore? You could have, in the Packers case, a Lombardi, a Bart Starr, an Aaron Rodgers, a Brett Favre. But what if you could only pick one quarterback? Packers have had guys like Reggie White, Ray Nitschke, Don Hudson. So it gets really tough when you have to think about it. And that's what we're going to be discussing next week. But we want your comments about your individual team. Before we get to next week, who's on your team's Mount Rushmore? Leave a message in the comments and we'll discuss it next week. Folks, I just learned we were doing this next week right now, too. Don't worry <laughs> about it. I'm excited for that. That's going to be a fun conversation. It will be. All right. One quarterback? One quarterback. Huh. Uh-huh. Huh. All right. Well, I have a week to do this. We'll, so we'll have a fight a- next week, in other words. <laughs> yeah, we will. Because I know you're going to be wrong. We're going to have a generational discussion. Don't worry, folks. I will make sure to get the right list, and you can remind him next week. (laughs) Thank you, as always, so much for watching. This has been Sports Talk with Dad. See you next time. Bye, everybody.